Please welcome Lord Attenborough. Sir, you are very welcome. I was hugely fascinated by the book, but also the title did make me smile. <laughs> Richard Attenborough, entirely up to you, darling, is called. <laughs> you are known, even among those of us who don't know you as a friend, as the man who calls everybody darling. And is the story true that it's just a name goes and so, well, if I call everybody darling, it'll be all right? It will, darling. It'll be perfect. <laughs> 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 uh, that's absolutely true. There's no uh, phoniness about it. I'm so old now. I never used to remember but, uh, names very easily, but now I'm impossible. <laughs> and so the easiest thing to do is to call Alan Darling. It's lovely to see you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I shall, I shall dine out on that forever. <laughs> the book is full of wonderful stories. It reminds me of all those early years in which we served with Noel Coward, for instance, who was a great mentor, it seemed, uh, early on. And then you moved on. And I suppose the one film that you'll be remembered for as a director more than any other, I guess, would be Gandhi, mm -hmm. because it was the most impossible project. But it seems to me you like impossible projects. Um, the, um, the one you did, um, uh, Oh, What's a Lovely War? Thousands oh, I of folk. we're going to forget the title. Oh, oh yeah. no, it's <laughs> only that. It was, yeah, I try and do it off the top of my head. So, Oh, What's a Lovely War, I remember, was masses of people. But Gandhi was, was that, did you have a million people or something at one point? A huge amount. We had a crowd, I, I can't remember. Did you just see the funeral? Yes. yes. Well, yeah. there, there were 400,000 people in that shot. Astonishing. Which was a lot of people. Yeah. Nowadays, of course, you do it with all fakery and tricks and so on. But when we did it, there were actually that number of people there. Yeah. You still managed to perform as well. As I said in, in the introduction, Miracle on 34th Street is one of our family's favourites and we sit down and watch it regularly and not just at Christmas. Have you always consciously kept the acting bit going as well as the directing bit? Does it give you as much pleasure? Yes, I, I am and, and was and, as I say, am an actor, basically. Uh, the directing has come... Uh, somewhat later, I, I, if I had to choose between the two, I would want to direct, as it were, as against acting, in that acting, well, as you know only too well, you come on, you say your lines, you play your part, and you go home, and the director and the editor and so on put it all together and decide to have that shot there and this shot there, whereas if you're the director, that's your prerogative. You are able to say at the end of the day, that's how it will be, that is the shot. I would like to select. What do you think the particular temperament and talents you have to have as a director to direct epics the way you do? What do you think are the most important um, talents? You have to be very bossy. <laughs> <laughs> shout a lot. No, I don't shout. Uh, I just say when somebody says, would you like me to do this or would you like me to do that or may I go home? And I say, Entirely up to you, darling. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, okay. And you know what they're going to do. <laughs> there are some very moving stories in the book as well. as It's not just simply a chronology of the life, which is what makes it all the more fascinating. I didn't know, for instance, that Prince of Wales had written to you um, way back in, I think it was 1984, you said, and asked you if you knew anybody who could coach Diana, Princess of Wales, in speaking, and you said, yes, I will. I was fascinated by that part of it because it seemed to me that you built up a remarkable relationship with Diana, Princess of Wales. Well, you knew her, I'm sure, didn't you? I Meet met her a couple of times, occasions. Yeah. I found her a totally enchanting woman, a very beautiful and very amusing and self-deprecating and so on. She was utterly unpompous. She was aware of her impact and what she could do. And the things that she'd wanted to do, she used her fame in order to get to that particular point. Mm. But she's very much, she very silly, stupidly said she was sick in a plank of wood or something. I can't remember the exact mm, quote. Sick as two short planks of wood. Yes. Yeah. But of course, it was nonsense. She mm. was very bright. And she was a wonderful mother, of course. I mean, the boys, I remember going to Kensington Palace to to talk to her about broadcasting and about speaking and so on, how you can manage to create a position whereby somebody wants to listen to what you're saying. 
And I remember I came out of the door and I was going to the car and the car stopped a few yards away and the doors opened and the two boys leapt out of the car and threw themselves at their mama. They absolutely adored her and she them. Mm. And I think she did a most marvelous thing. She decided that the boys ought to n know the rest of the world other than the particular world in which they had grown up and, and, and were restricted to. And she would take them out to, uh, the M to M S or Tesco or whatever it was, quite unbeknown, without, tra without um, uh, security and so on, just in order that they could see mm -hmm. how people behaved if they didn't realize who they were talking to. It, it was her determination to make them part of the world and, and appreciative of what they had as the position in which they were and the circle in which they moved. They, they, she was quite magical. It was obviously a great personal loss to you when she died. You then had an even greater loss uh, in 2004 when you lost your daughter and your granddaughter in the tsunami on Boxing Day in Thailand. I think the most moving thing in the book, not, not to dwell on the event as it were, but afterwards I think the fact that you said you couldn't listen to music I found was really terribly touching. That was true, Alan. I mm. could not... The children, because the family loves music and because they participated in their school choirs and that sort of thing, and they loved Sinatra, who they got to know, and um, Jane's godfather was Sir Malcolm Sargent, for instance. And so music as such was very prominent in their lives. And particular pieces of music, I'm not a very religious man, but uh, I uh, am in huge admiration of the Messiah. And I remember being taken to the Messiah when I was 13 or 14 by my parents. And I remember taking Jane to hear the Messiah at the Albert Hall. And there's a wonderful solo sung by one of the solo, one of the female soloists uh, called I Know That My Redeemer Liveth. And I find that now disturbingly moving <laughs> because uh, it summarizes Ginny um, in the simplicity and the absolute belief that there are things worthy of respect and adulation in many ways. And Handel meant so much to Jane. And I. Lucy would, would go for Puccini more, but I can't really hear Handel, mm. or couldn't. Uh, it's a number of years now, and it, the pain doesn't get any less. Mm. But you come to manage it. You come to, you, at least I do, I'm sure you know what I mean, you I sort of put it I in do. a little box, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. you put Ginny and Lucy over there, and periodically, particularly with Sheila, we have time together thinking about the children. We hope that we have lots more time with you. Thank you for sharing happy memories and moving memories with us. Great pleasure to talk to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Lord Attenborough.